around over 70, 80 countries in World Vision Days. I never got to Vanuatu. Vanuatu, however, is a place also where World Vision works. I, I feel a little bit of a fraud with this uh, Bible text this morning about the wise man building his house upon the rock, the fool on the sand. I now live on the beach at Frankston, <laughs> right on the sand. And uh, I'm sort of comforted when a uh, non-Christian uh, person who came and inspected our house said, actually, sand, compacted sand, is much more stable than anything else. <laughs> I thought, did Jesus get it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly on the beach, which is lovely, and it's been lovely in, in COVID. Um, I have had opportunity to reflect that we have a front view of literally climate change. Wow, the winds and the storms rocking in, and even though we're in a brick house, your times feel like you're on a boat. It howls and it seems to move. Uh, my kids worry, they say, why did you buy there, Dad? I say, look, 
It's not my problem. You'll inherit the first floor. Uh, the ground may be underwater. I'm going to be enjoying uh, the, the next years. Now, I say all that because um, there's terrific notes in our order of service about Vanuatu. One of the things that uh, you may not realise is that on the hazard risk register that the UN assembles every year, the riskiest place in the world for the last five years to live is Vanuatu. Cyclones, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes. In fact, in the last five years between Vanuatu and Fiji, that sea basin, five, category five, category five is the worst, cyclones. The leaders in Vanuatu and the people in Vanuatu know that something has profoundly changed. I was very struck when I took Pacific Island Christian leaders to Canberra to meet the Prime Minister. We launched uh, the Pacific Friends, Parliamentary Friends of the Pacific, Prime Minister and Opposition Leader and uh, a lot of MPs and ambassadors, the American ambassador and others were all there. And uh, I welcomed the Pacific leaders, made a speech. Uh, our Prime Minister has a very deep affinity with the Pacific. When he was 18 or 19, his first mission trip with his church was to Fiji. And he does have deep memories, affections and emotions. But I had warned the Pacific leaders that there's a bit of a political issue in Australia. It's called we don't want to mitigate in climate change terms, uh, that is cut coal because it's got jobs and therefore be a little bit sensitive raising the issue of climate change. We went into the Prime Minister's office, he was wonderful. They talked about a number of the issues that we've reflected on today. The lack of education in the Pacific and the lack of job opportunities and if those cruise ships stopped, which they have with COVID, going into Port Villa, the jobs right across the Pacific, certainly in Vanuatu, just dry up. No opportunities. And that's actually what's happened. They've been terrific at keeping out COVID-19. They've done really well. But the cruise ships have all stopped. And the jobs and their hopes for a job, as reflected in the readings uh, we had today, are gone. Hopefully gone. So the church leaders with the Prime Minister were terrific. And then the uh, Methodist Secretary of the Pacific Churches, uh, Fijian, but we had Vanuatuans there, and from Tuvalu, from all the Pacific, we had church leaders. The, uh, the Secretary, James Bartland, Reverend James Bartland, said to the Prime Minister, can I pray for you, Prime Minister? Scott Morrison said, absolutely. And we bowed our heads and prayed. And then, to my amazement, Reverend James Bagwan did, with great eloquence, quoting scripture, the best prayer about climate change I've ever heard. Why they are feeling threatened. The Prime Minister was nodding and saying Amen. Because he understood when we often, as Christians, go, climate change, isn't that a left green issue? These are the most conservative people in, on every issue in our world. They're church leaders who are deeply conservative, evangelical, Catholic, from whatever backgrounds. And the existential anxiety in their voices about seeing what is happening, what has changed, came through in that prayer. I see a little bit of sitting on my veranda overlooking Port Villa Bay, literally just on the sand. But they are living with the cyclones, the extraordinary weather events that is profoundly affecting them. So when we read the text, build, build your house on the rock, we know that these low-lying islands, some 83 of them, are really in trouble. This is real for them, and we need here to listen to our brothers and sisters 
Christian brothers and sisters, conservative Christian brothers and sisters, when they talk about climate change. That uh, Sermon on the Mount of Matthew, which goes over at least three chapters, um, has a wonderful phrase in it, a uh, paragraph in it, about loving your enemies. Jesus said, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. I always thought it would have been smarter if Jesus had been a bit more practical. Why didn't he just say, avoid your enemies? That's useful advice, isn't it? <laughs> if he wanted to stretch us a bit, why didn't he say, tolerate your enemies? That's hard, huh? But maybe, all right, I can tolerate them. It's always amazing Jesus said, love your enemies. I have often reflected on this through the life of Mahatma Gandhi, who read this. And Mahatma Gandhi, who never really got Jesus, he was always really Hindu. He read the Sermon on the Mount and it shaped his whole approach. He got the teaching of the Kingdom of God. In some ways, I think Mahatma Gandhi, though a Hindu, actually was helping to Christianize the unchristianness of some parts of Christianity, if that makes sense. To Christianize the unchristianness of some parts of Christianity. Because he took love your enemy seriously. He said, If my enemy hurts me, I will not submit, but I will suffer. I will go on a fast to change their heart. I will never be violent. His whole movement was based on Jesus. Never violence. Turning the other cheek. I will. Match your capacity to infl inflict violence by my capacity to suffer. Martin Luther King later put it that way. When he was marching a black Baptist minister for civil rights saying, we will never hate you, we will love you. And when you're violent, we will suffer and go on loving you. Well, I'm very struck by this when I come to Vanuatu and think about it because uh, the economic and the political issues you've read there's a wonderful briefing. Uh, it's complex. The Vanuatuans and the Pacific Islanders would say we're actually like the coconut floating in the water. The top 20% is all you see of a coconut floating in the water but that's the formal economy. Underneath, 80% of the coconut is actually our gardens and but that we can feed it ourselves. But of course, when you have aspirations for education and you see, as they do on TV, other opportunities and better jobs and better pay, just subsistence farming, the 80% in the gardens, is not satisfying. You can't blame young people for that. It's a complex, complex place whether it's Vanuatu or the Pacific Islands. But one thing that is quite extraordinary about the whole Pacific and particularly Vanuatu is it is dominated by two things, chiefs and church. Chiefs because of the fact that government, as we understand it, is really a construct still. It's the chiefs that you have loyalty to who actually lay down the, the laws. And so many different chiefs. Here is another amazing fact about Vanuatu. Not only the most dangerous place in the world to live, particularly because of the climate change things happening, but secondly, it is the most linguistically diverse place. So while Papua New Guinea has 18% of the world's population with 8 million people, Vanuatu has 120 languages, not dialects, languages. Different languages, without a word in common, with 230,000 people. Imagine that. 120. And chiefs and their language and their tribal groups explain a whole lot of this extraordinary diversity. Now, I mentioned chiefs and church. When the missionaries came, Every denomination is there, 99% of Vanuatans are 
Christian. But at one really serious point, chiefs and church are really struggling. The warrior male chiefly culture and the particular readings of scripture that taught the men that they were the leaders, they would need to discipline their wives. <laughs> they would have the wives submitting to them. Means that Vanuatu, with a reading of the Bible, have plugged into a patriarchal warrior chief culture, has terrible, terrible domestic violence. Seven out of ten women in Vanuatu get beaten. Children get beaten too. Only the most serious, aggressive assaults or murders are people locked up in jail. The jails could not hold all the assault going on. Now sadly, this is something which has been dominating our politics for the last two weeks, hasn't it? <laughs> Women and their protection. Well, in Vanuatu, this is a profoundly disturbing issue. So what are now churches doing and organisations like the one I formerly led, World Vision, doing? We're starting men's groups for men's behaviour, peer groups. We aren't talking terms like gender equality, which in the West we might understand. We're taking the Bible and with a program called Channels of Hope, we're just starting in Genesis chapter 1. You know in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27? is the most profound verse. It says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, God created male and female. He created them. Before we get to later Genesis, where's the, the story of Eve being created from Adam's rib. So woman is derived, secondary, must submit. You can see where that ends up with a chiefly warrior culture. <laughs> In Genesis 1.27, God created male and female. So when we take pastors, men who are all Christian, through Genesis and they see this, it's an eye opener. Of course, we take them to Galatians 3.28, in Christ neither male nor female. While there may be differences and different roles, in God's eyes, in God's eyes, complete and total equality. Now, no one is created in God's eyes to be abused. No one's created to be an abuser. This is sinful. I remember sitting in the Solomon Arch and how they need us to respond. Far better than us whites going in there. They absolutely resonated with someone from their Polynesian culture who wasn't white. And we're just taking them through scripture, like Genesis 1, Galatians 3.28. We started the whole three days of Bible by getting them to draw a picture of what makes a man a man and a woman a woman in their culture. The Archbishop went first, he held up his picture as a man with a spear. The man was kicking obstacles out of the way. He said the man is strong, a leader, a warrior. He pushes obstacles aside. That's who a man is. He then held up his picture of a woman. This is the Archbishop, the Anglican Archbishop. The woman had a big tongue curled out of her mouth and took curled around. He said a woman gossips. <laughs> A woman makes trouble. And then he said these words. A woman needs to be disciplined. That's what he said. By the end of the first day, and I watched this, one bishop started sobbing. His hot body heaving. And through tears, because we stopped and said, are you okay, you will need a break, he sobbed, I've just realised I'm an abuser. And he kept crying. If my wife hasn't been in the vegetable patch, the garden, as I told her, I discipline her. If the dinner's not on the table when I told her, I discipline her. By the end of three days, just using Bible, we ask them now, draw a picture of what makes a man a man in God's eyes, not in your culture. 
And what makes a woman a woman in God's eyes, not in your culture? Let me tell you, they are profoundly different pictures. Using scripture to actually challenge that chiefly and in part church teaching that played into that dominance over women. Well, when I think of how we pray, particularly for the women and the girls, it's the same prayer I've been praying for the last two weeks here in Australia as we face these issues. When are we going to understand that we are all made equal in God's image? We are made equal in God's image. This was revolutionary in biblical times. A lot of the very strong sexual ethics in the New Testament about protection of women was because in Greek and Roman society, women were the property of men, particularly slaves or inferior. Any old nobleman could take that woman. It wasn't against the law. The sexual ethic was to protect women. In that culture. Likewise, even in Vanuatu and the Pacific, some might say in Australia, but certainly there, men still have an idea that women are property. Their property. Their property to dominate. And they can pick out, sadly, some verses, maybe the missionaries mistakenly taught them to justify that way of thinking. Church and chiefs are actually what I'd love you to pray about and pray for. To act, to honour a culture, but to say when a culture will not treat women as equal. When it allows vindication, justification for violence against women. For seeing them as property. This is our prayer. In Christ, neither male nor female. In Christ, neither male nor female, equal, respected, loved. So let me finish by saying, to build on that rock of understanding that the New Testament was unprecedented in its, not just sexual ethic to protect women and the slave and those who are vulnerable, but it was rock to save in cultures, whatever the culture is, where we want always a story of why we feel superior to someone, better than someone, over someone, having authority, that that is what sin, sin is. That is sin. And when it comes to men over women, how this in the name of Christ has to be challenged and named. Pray for particularly the women of Vanuatu in those terms. Amen. Gracious God, we pray for the people of Donvale Presbyterian Church who have accepted the role of coordinating the World Day of Prayer <coughs> service in 2022. We ask your blessing upon them and upon those who need to pray and prepare the service. Amen. Amen.